Thank you all for coming today. I, I have um, uh, announced many panels in the past. Uh, I personally think this is one of the most exciting. Uh, I also have to profess that when Dr. Chris Tucker came to me with this idea, um, uh, at, at first I was trying to figure out a role for the Academy, but with his persuasive personality and energy, he convinced me that this was a very happening area and that this was the time to have this discussion. We've got, I use the term, a perfect storm here of events happening. We've got the technology being um, uh, at a level that it, it, it can be used for a variety of purposes. It's been proven on the private sector. Uh, in the private sector, it's been proven in the DOD, Intel agencies. It's not been fully utilized on the civilian side of, of government. But we have terrific budget cuts that are anticipated in 2012, and we're going to have to do business differently across the board government-wide. Government and then we have Zob Briggs' thoughtful memo that's pretty much started getting federal agencies, civilian agencies, to look at place-based decision-making. <clears throat> and um, I'm an old Fed with 34-year history in, in federal agencies. And I am an alumni of OMB, so when I saw the memo, I have to profess that I was a little cynical about whether it was being adopted by agencies. But in the course of preparing for testimony this week, I went back to one of my former agencies and was surprised at how many references there were to place-based decision making. So I think that we're going to see many changes uh, in the federal government, and I think it'll be a very, very exciting period. This particular panel and our speakers today um, it, this panel and the speakers are very, very heavy-hitting, busy, thoughtful uh, individuals who have incredibly demanding jobs. So with no further ado, um, I will turn it over to you, Scott, after I've made the introduction. Okay. First of all, and we've got Mark Riker. And I'm going to try to do this from my notes and by an order, which means that some of you may get different uh, titles and different names, but bear with me. Mark Riker is closest to me, and he's president and CEO of the Open Geospatial Consortium. This is the organization that sets standards for, for the geospatial, um, for geospatial information. So this is the regulatory standard organization. Then we have Jerry Johnson, this is actually working out sort of well, who's the Geospatial Information Officer for EPA. And many of you may know that he is responsible for, geosp for being the geospatial lead uh, for the DataGov initiative. So I, I suspect that many of you uh, know Jerry. Then we have Michael Byrne, who's the GIO at the FCC and most noted for the National Broadband Map. This is his I was going to say baby, but this, he's responsible for getting this um, deployed. Now we're not particularly in order, so let's see. Keith Barber, okay, is um, with the National Geospatial Agency and um, uh, probably one of the most informed individuals in the government in terms of geospatial geospatial capabilities and what it can do throughout government. He's also not only informed, he's a practitioner and has deployed geospatial technologies. Okay, <coughs> next is Raphael Bostic, who's Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research at HUD. And um, he's representative of what I, I said about civilian agencies beginning to um, come into this geospatial world and use place-based de decision-making in his programs and in HUD. Um, uh, I personally think it would be very interesting to see how the civilian agencies 
implement place-based decision making, and Raphael will be <coughs> leading the charge, I'm sure. Lastly, we have Zav Briggs, who is the author, well, I should say, the lead author, um, because OMB has many, uh, as most of you who've been there know, uh, OMB has a real clearance process that is pretty heavy duty, but it's all his idea. Zav Briggs, in his spare time, is the program associate director for the general government's part of OMB, which takes care of half of the cabinet agencies and many, many federal employees and programs. So this is a busy man, and um, uh, we will listen to you, and then when you need to cut out to go back to work, we will be appalled, but we'll bear with you. Okay. <laughs> Lastly, Scott Fossler. Scott is a fellow of the National Academy, as am I. Uh, he and I have done work on, uh, at the Academy as members of the Board of Directors. Scott also served as president of the National Academy, so we have a lot in common in that regard. And he's very, very interested in information technologies and its capabilities to uh, transform government. So he will be our moderator. And with that, um, we'll start this session. Thank you very much, Chris. Welcome to everybody. We're delighted to have you with us. Um, we have an excellent uh, panel uh, to uh, discuss uh, uh, this issue. Um, we, we really have kind of two elements that we're trying to get together. One is, is place-based initiatives, approaches, policies. And by place, we mean literally a place. Anything from a, from a household, uh, perhaps a somewhat more grandiose uh, household, like a curiously high-walled compound in Pakistan, um, to a village, to a city, to a county, to a region, a state, a nation, the globe, and sometimes even, even beyond. Um, it has always been a challenge for government policy to figure out how to integrate different policies and different activities to focus on particular places. Um, now we've got these extraordinary new technologies uh, which offer a tremendous opportunity to do precisely that. And the challenge is to figure out how to make use of those technologies in support of place-based initiatives. Um, we're going to um, uh, have each of our panel members uh, uh, give us their thoughts for about 10 minutes, and then we're going to have a conversation uh, among us, um, and then we will open it up to the audience and uh, get, uh, get your thoughts. And uh, Chris has already introduced the panel. To be fair, we're going to go in the opposite order from which you introduced them. And uh, so we'll go right on down the line, and we'll start uh, with uh, Xavier Briggs. Xavier? Good morning, everybody. It's uh, terrific to be here. Uh, thank you, Scott. Great thanks to Chris and to Jonathan um, and to Chris Tucker as well for being a, a fire starter in this. I have to say about Chris Marcy's introduction, I haven't heard the words terrific and budget cuts put together in the same sentence <laughs> in my tenure to me, but it, it is um, appropriate to the times. Budget climate, as you can imagine, is one of my one of my themes this morning. I'm going to uh, walk through some ideas very quickly. Um, just uh, delighted that we're having this conversation. It's going to be enormously useful for us to stay in touch with Napa and its members and anything that, that spins out of this. Um, I think the we're at sort of a unique moment for a variety of reasons I'll, I'll outline in a second. The budget climate, the president's larger vision and mandate to us around government reorganization, uh, some of the things we're doing around regulatory streamlining. There's sort of a, there are a number of planets aligning in a way that I think is quite friendly to this. But let me take you back, first of all, uh, about two years. Um, when we put together the first memorandum, the first edition, if you will, the one that Chris referenced, in the spring of 2009, there was a, a second edition that followed the next year that tried to build on it. When we put together that first one, we had a, a number of overall goals, a number of, of main goals. I'm going to outline three very briefly. One was to articulate a, a specific case uh, for how and why the federal government should be sensitive to context, should think about places and relate itself in an integrated fashion, in a strategic fashion, two places. Uh, now, to Scott's list of what a place can be, 
I would add, for example, uh, an ecosystem or a watershed. Those things are, are perfectly uh, valid as well. I will acknowledge, however, in our original thinking and in the, in the drafting that we did, we primarily had in mind what planners call, and urban historians call, human settlements. Forgive the clinical term, but the, the notion is a human settlement can be everything from a tiny village to a great mega region. We had in mind places that people inhabit and that they are trying to live and work in effectively, uh, as opposed to, say, a military base or a national park or reserve, or, which are obviously important places as well. But the most important thing was to make a case for why relating the federal government to, to context and doing so in an integrated fashion uh, was important and timely. Goal number two was building on that to make the case for reform. In other words, to challenge agencies and invite them. This was a budget guidance memo, keep in mind. So there was, building on Chris's point, there was homework in the memorandum for agencies to get back to us with submissions um, in the fall, there was a specific call for using place and using the lens of place or relating to specific context as a tool for reform. I'll give you a quick example. I had a, a wonderful conversation um, last year at the Department of Justice. It's one of my agencies. It was convened on that end uh, by the justice leadership and a number of the bureau or unit heads were there. And I articulated a specific kind of challenge, and I did so in a friendly way. We were talking about a major American city that was uh, desperately in need of criminal justice reform, where the mayor had reached out to the attorney general. And I sort of put it this way. This place, this context is, um, I want to invite you to consider, it is a test case, in effect, for whether there is a synergy among the different things that live in your department. Does the U.S. attorneys relate in any strategic or systematic way to the office that worries about the hiring of police officers and policing practice and those that work on ex-offender re-entry and those that worry about drug courts and go on down the list? Um, now, there may be some parts that don't relate quite as directly. Maybe the FBI or, you know, one could have that conversation. But in other words, it's, it was a test case for whether there's a synergy among the parts, whether you can even mobilize within your own walls, let alone with other federal departments when it matters. So number two, the goal was to make a case that this place lens, and thinking about place policy, is a tool for reform. It's a, it's a, it's a discipline. Um, and it's an analytic tool. And the third goal we had uh, to sort of tie a bow around these others was to make the case that taking place-based approaches, while not crucial for every problem everywhere, um, is essential for meeting national goals. We made a specific argument along those lines. And by the way, we wanted to do all three of these things, each in its own way, sort of nuanced, without writing a treatise, because no one would read it and it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. So it's, it's a fairly compact document. It has the homework assignment at the end. Please get back to us with submissions. They should include X, Y, Z in, in fine OMB fashion. We try to spell out what we want to see. But, uh, you know, included in this brief sort of upfront part was a specific case that unless the federal government can think more systematically about places, apply a variety of tools, we didn't go into great detail as to what they might be, invitations to the agencies to get back to us, to use their own tools and imagination, unless we can do that, we will have a hard time meeting a range of national goals. Number one, economic competitiveness. We're a nation of economic regions. There's no other way. We need economic engines at the local level. We need to figure out how to help them prosper, how to help them find their way. Can't be airmailed in from Washington, but there are things we can do to support in more savvy and cost-effective ways. We'll have a hell of a time meeting uh, goals related to climate and environmental sustainability. We'll have a hell of a time uh, making our population more well, improving health outcomes, while bringing health care costs down. And you can sort of go on down the list, but we articulated a variety of national goals, some perhaps more intuitive and familiar, others less so in relationship to place. And we tried to explain what place policy is as, as distinct from other kinds of policy. Um, when it comes to operationalizing this, and what we're doing now, my colleagues 
on the panel from the agencies are in the best uh, position to tell the story. What I'd like to do in closing is to articulate um, what I see as some of the unanswered questions and some of the opportunities uh, going forward. Given the fiscal climate, given the President's uh, challenge to all of us to think very hard about how a 21st century federal government should be organized, mindful, this is appropriately said at an app event, mindful of the many reasons for which ambitious reworks are challenging, sometimes not worth it, often opposed, mindful of all of those things, uh, that we nevertheless owe it to ourselves to do a rethink and at least to push in, in certain critical areas. He talked about this a bit in the State of the Union a few months ago. Given that context, given the number of things that are going on, given how far we have to go still in the economic recovery, what are some key questions and, and opportunities? I want to mention three. Um, number one, when it comes to decision support technologies, including geospatial technologies that are critical to taking smarter, more effective place-based approaches, um, it is my judgment that what will be most persuasive is a set of very uh, well-organized, sharply written business cases, if you will. Here is the, I'm not saying anything profound when I say this, here is the value add, here's why there would be a value add uh, for specific kinds of government functions. Um, it will not proceed most effectively from what I would call more of a supply side orientation. Here are all the fabulous technologies that are in fact available. Uh, why aren't you using more of them? I, I don't see that approach as having a whole lot of promise. I think we have to uh, invest much more on, on the demand side, including what I would call um, working on the what economists would call latent demand, as in you don't know you want something because you don't know it exists. Um, it's completely fair to say that public managers, using the term broadly now in many agencies, are not aware of what they're missing, if you will. That's a place to start, but it's not a place to stop. And I would uh, humbly and respectfully advise against coming to OMB, in particular with the grand vision, in lieu of the very disciplined business cases in specific areas. Um, I say this in part because at the end of the day, geo-enabling technologies, like others, they're part of a larger set of things we're worried about in the information and communication technology space. And in each instance, um, you know, our, our approach, especially this administration, has been usable segments, uh, I'm not saying quick wins necessarily, but measurable progress, things we can see, things we can point to, things we can measure in six months, 12 months, 14 months, much less the kind of five and 10 year vision uh, of where, where we might be. Number two, I think there's some big questions ahead, just broadening Scott and Chris's uh, opening remarks a little bit about how aspirations in this area relate to larger questions about the organization of work. Not just for the federal government, by the way, for other uh, parts of the public sector, the private and nonprofit sector as well. What's the workplace going to look like? How is it changing? How does ubiquitous uh, use of wireless broadband technology uh, so-called hoteling, relying on sort of temporary office connections, working mainly out in the field. How does that interact with, or how might it interact with, a reorganization and redesign of work and what federal workers and others um, actually do in order to be effective? Cloud computing is a part of that. Again, these other things that I've ticked off are a part of that. I'm sure folks in the room are quite familiar with these trends. I'm not sure we thought about them together in a way that's systematic and, and as creative as possible. GSA is another of my agencies. I've had a number of conversations with them about this. I would like the GSA, I think the GSA administrator would like her agency to uh, focus far more on sort of value-added consulting, leaning in and being a gadfly and saying to agencies, have you thought about X, Y, Z? There's a different way you could do this rather than being more of an order-taking window. Given what you want, I'll go and look for the real estate. If you see the distinction I'm drawing, the different approach. Third and finally, um, I've mentioned this, but let me say a, a sentence or two about reorganization. I think that in, in, the, in the same sense in which we need to have a very demand side sort of orientation, make the business case and whatnot, 
I hope that you'll be willing to think with us about where um, place-based approaches and very sharp questions about operating models for them, about how those include uh, geospatial technologies and more. Or in other words, about embedding the geospatial technologies in new ways of operating that include um, perhaps different reporting relationships, teamwork um, sorts of structures. I'll, I'll cite just one example. There are many, and you could take off disaster response and recovery. You could go through environmental sustainability and a whole host of things. Let's just talk about the economy, since it's rightly sort of top of mind for everyone. We know that we don't have nimble structures for relating the federal government's assets and requirements to regions. Uh, we can envision teams that would provide that more nimble approach. You can imagine team leads that would act as Sherpas and coordinators and value-added consultants. You can imagine agencies acting as agents for one another rather than doing a lot of duplicative work. At the moment, the feds are frustrated, state and local governments are frustrated, the private sector is frustrated. If we're going to be smarter about geo-enablement and geospatial technologies as a part of place-based approaches, I would submit to you uh, that as part of developing them most effectively and making the business case and so on, we need to think about embedding them in new, uh, more energetic, more nimble operating models that have us acting more as one government. In our best moments, I think we're actually able to, to do this, and it's often disasters that show us how, because there's no margin for acting otherwise. In more of a steady state, if you will, we're far less successful. So sorry to end on a, uh, a pessimistic note, but I think I'll close there. Thank you. Great, Xavier. Thank you very much, Raphael. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. I'm a, it's a pleasure to be invited to be on this panel. Um, in many ways, I drew the short end of the stick having to go after Zaf was always so eloquent. Um, but I wanted to uh, just uh, really uh, emphasize all the things that Zav said. Uh, what we're trying to do at HUD and um, the agencies that we're interacting with is really uh, execute the vision that was put forward by OMB. Um, HUD is a place-based agency at its heart. Um, almost all the funds that uh, go through our department are deployed to places. Our grantees are counties and cities and states. And so we think very fundamentally in a place-based, uh, through a place-based lens. But uh, we don't always uh, use our geospatial technology or technology more generally in the most effective ways. And that's been one of the things that uh, my secretary, my boss secretary Donovan, has been very interested in. Um, it was interesting, Chris, that your um, introduction made a distinction between civilian versus uh, the defense and, and intelligence communities. I think that's a, actually quite an important distinction because uh, for civilian agencies like mine, we don't actually make decisions uh, about where resources are spent or what projects they're spent on. Um, we provide funding, the locals do that. And so our role in these sorts of things is, uh, is that we've got to ask, cajole, uh, incentivize, beg sometimes, uh, for certain sorts of approaches to be taken, and it requires a, a, a fair amount of creativity uh, on our part to capture the attention of people who are incredibly busy on their own right and um, trying to uh, get them to, to change how they operate. I want to just say at a very high level, because one of the things I've been charged with is trying to take HUD and make HUD uh, coherent in a geospatial context, and that's been extremely difficult. Um, and it's difficult because, well, for a number of reasons, but let me just say that in order for this to succeed, it requires purposeful direction uh, from leadership to say, uh, we're going to do this. Um, every person, as they do their job, has got to think about how they're impacting place, and more than that, how they're going to take geospatial technologies and other technologies and use it to enhance their focus on place. Uh, that message is... Um, often implied, uh, but it's, it, the implied character often means that it's not really internalized by and so it doesn't actually happen. Uh, and so my role is really to create structure and order in an otherwise chaotic environment, 
uh, and really to uh, create a patchwork or a quilt that takes sort of the, te the technological realities, that takes the subject matter and programmatic realities, and it gets them to be integrated. Um, there were four, there were six questions that we were asked to talk about. I'm going to touch on four of them very, very quickly. The first is just an articulation of what place-based public management is. Um, to my mind, uh, what we're talking about really is management that promotes decision making um, that, uh, that really involves uh, crossing what you might think of, I've heard creatively called cylinders of excellence, uh, others would call them silos. Um, but we, what we're really looking for are decisions that are, that, and solutions and strategies that cross up, that, that aren't bound by programs, or aren't bound by funding streams, or aren't bound by a particular departmental structure, but rather bring all of these things together uh, in the same room to, to really embrace the context that Zod was talking about and, uh, and leverage the resources that are available across the board. Uh, we have a tremendously um, expansive uh, field operation. And so we do some housing assistance, we do public housing, we do FHA stuff, we do community-based development. And we have uh, leadership and headquarters that directs our staff in those four areas. We have spent the last four or five months trying to figure out how those folks in the field actually talk to each other. Who gets to, who has the authority to convene? Who gets to decide what a course of action should be? And, and it's, you have to write these things down. You have to write them out uh, because it does often require uh, delegations and subjugations of authority uh, that are sometimes quite difficult to embrace. We're doing that um, at HUD, um, and I will say it, it's gone in fits and starts, uh, but it is making progress and it's important. Another thing that we're, we're doing specifically is, is we're reaching out to our agency partners and building collaborative approaches to solving problems. So we have a neighborhood revitalization initiative, uh, which takes programs from my department, as well as the Department of Education, as well as the Department of Justice, and the Department of Health and Human Services, and says we want to, in, to provide clear guidance that communities, when they think about the deployment of resources, think about all four of them together. So um, we're, we have started to in, include in our grant uh, processes, our competitive grant processes, extra points. If you have invested in your education in communities, if you've invested in uh, your health services or your justice services, really saying we're going to step up with how we allocate our resources based on the notion that you have to have real place-based orientation. So we're, we're trying some real creative things and you know, we're putting our money where our mouth is and, and really uh, sending a signal. And what I've heard uh, fairly consistently across the board is that um, our direction has caused cr uh, connections and conversations at the local level that never happened before. Transportation people didn't actually know the housing people. The uh, health people uh, didn't know what the planning process was to be able to weigh in on it. And now we're starting to get those, those uh, synergies together that should hopefully uh, persist and lead to uh, different modes of conversation and different factors being integrated into decision making. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the geospatial stuff. And um, I got, came to geospatial uh, from my, my previous life at USC as a professor in Los Angeles, we did a neat exercise using maps, and people still talk about it you know, 12 years later. It was, and so for me, I do understand the power of it. Um, what I would say is that there's a real challenge in getting uh, geospatial technologies uh, integrated into decision making. I would agree wholeheartedly with what Zab said. Um, you have got to have this be a demand driven exercise. And you've got to really demonstrate pretty clearly how the technology improves decision making for specific decisions and, um, and can continue to be uh, a value add. Um, and I really view this as a fundamental conundrum. Right? And the conundrum is, in this space we're talking about, there are really three classes of actors. There are the decision makers, city council members, mayors, they know they have to make a decision. They probably don't know all the details about whatever topic they're talking about. You've got a bunch of techies, and the techies love the technology. They think bells and whistles must be as neat, sophisticated as possible. 
And then you've got the subject matter experts uh, who are going to be in your bureaucracy, who are going to really be running things, creating the arguments, making the case. And they really view the world quite differently. And they don't know what each of the other ones knows. And so it's really interesting that Zab talked about um, not knowing the utility that is possible. Uh, because really what we need to do, and the challenge is to get all three of those classes of agents in our public uh, discourse to be in the same room talking about the same things, focused on specific questions or problems. Um, too often the techies are in abstract world. I was in a conversation yesterday um, where our technology folks are putting out data sets on a monthly basis and there is not one person in the senior leadership that knows this is happening. Right. So there's no, there's no strategic activities, there's no um, real um, active engagement in terms of how do we do this in a way that maximizes uh, the decision making utility, the quality and the value add of these products. Um, at the same time you have subject matter experts know the subjects have not really thought two minutes about how we might use our data or present it in ways that can embrace and grab the public and capture the imagination and create a shared understanding or consensus about what the state of play is on the ground. And um, they're too busy really to, to figure out on their own how to make that happen. And this gets back to the notion of purposeful direction. Uh, so what we're trying to do is, um, is really have someone like me uh, make sure that we have all three types of people in the room for every one of the decisions we're making and that we think that actively and directly, directly how we best uh, deploy uh, the geospatial technology to help with specific decisions. The last thing I, I would say is um, Zav was a little vaguer on this. I want to be explicit. I think one of the, the real uh, strategic errors that's been made in this area has been the desire to hit the home run, to take something and be uh, fully comprehensive, fully complete to answer every question you could possibly conceive of. That's really hard. I mean, in baseball, there aren't that many good home run hitters. And even they don't hit that many home runs uh, relative to how many times they're at bat. Uh, I think particularly in this budget environment, it is critical that we have some single sitters, uh, that we get a, a series of successes and, and quick wins uh, that then makes the case that um, for every dollar you invest in this, you're going to get a, a whole lot of dollars back. And that's the, the really the, the foundation and the, the frame that we're going to have to use in terms of public investments for uh, the foreseeable future. So um, thank you again. I look forward to uh, the conversation.